Repeated sprint training involves maximal effort sprints, lasting 10 seconds or less, interspersed with brief recovery periods, for example 60 seconds or less. These repeated sprints can be cycling or swimming, but running repeated sprint training exposes athletes to maximal sprinting, acceleration, deceleration and change of direction, making it a very useful conditioning method for the general physical preparation of field and court based athletes. Furthermore, because repeated sprint training elicits a substantial aerobic and anaerobic response while simultaneously providing an intensive neuromuscular stimulus, it can be considered a time efficient multi component conditioning method. For example, when athletes perform repeated sprint training, you can expect to see an average heart rate of around 80 to 90 percent of max heart rate and oxygen consumption around 70 to 80% of VO2 max, with blood lactate concentrations reaching above 10 millimoles, demonstrating the acute demand on the glycolytic system, while sessions are typically perceived as very hard. However, variation in the prescription of programming variables can influence the training load of repeated sprint training, which may result in diverse training adaptations. Therefore, to help advance repeated sprint training prescription, Fraser Furlow and colleagues conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis, which was published in the Journal of Sports Medicine, titled The Effects of Repeated Sprint Training on Physical Fitness and Physiological Adaptation in Athletes. This presentation, brought to you by Talking Sports Science, will be a summary of Furlow and colleagues' research. Firstly, studies were only included in analysis if the repeated sprint training was performed as a running land-based intervention, on a flat surface and involve maximum intensity sprints with a mean work duration of 10 seconds or less and a rest duration of 60 seconds or less with the repeated sprint training intervention carried out over a minimum of 2 and a maximum of 12 weeks performed by healthy injury free athletes of any sex aged between 14 and 35 years and according to the participant classification framework had a minimum competitive level of tier 2, trained. Furthermore, the repeated sprint training must have been completed under normal conditions, for example, usual nutritional intake, and performed as an independent experimental training intervention and not combined with any training that was outside the athlete's usual practice, for example, repeated sprint training plus plyometric training. Studies must have reported at least one outcome measure. Measured before and after the repeated sprint training intervention, which was then compared to a control group who performed their usual sports training under normal conditions without any additional interventions. In the end, 40 studies met the criteria. 19 studies involved highly trained slash national level athletes, while 21 studies involved trained slash developmental level athletes, allowing data from 48 repeated sprint training groups and 19 active control groups to be analysed. The analysis revealed that running based repeated sprint training causes a moderate improvement in VO2 max, yo-yo intermittent recovery level 1 distance, repeated sprint ability decrement, as well as small improvements in 10 and 20 meter sprint time repeated sprint ability average time, counter-movement jump height, and change of direction ability. Specific analysis of the raw units of data revealed that VO2 max is improved by approximately 4%, equivalent to an improvement of 2.2 ml per kilogram per minute from baseline, while yo-yo intermittent recovery level 1 distance performance is improved by approximately 16%, which equates to a mean improvement of 252 meters. And regarding sprint performance, repeated sprint training improves 10 and 20 meter sprint times by 2 to 3%, which equates to improvements of 0.04 and 0.06 seconds respectively. Specific improvements for the other performance measures weren't calculated from the raw units of data due to concerns of comparing results between different testing methods and protocols used between the studies. Based on the analysis, 
the prescription of three sets of 6 times 30 meters straight line sprints, with 20 seconds of passive, inter-repetition rest, twice per week, for six weeks, is a highly effective, repeated sprint training program to achieve the aforementioned improvements in physical fitness. However, performing an extra set per session, i.e. four sets, can lead to additional improvement in intermittent running performance. And four sets of low repetitions, for example between four to six reps, is more effective than longer sets, for example two sets of 10 to 12 repetitions, as it allows the maintenance of sprint performance. And while the most common interset rest prescription for repeated sprint training is four minutes, when a higher number of sets are implemented, in order to maintain the time efficient nature of repeated sprint training, shorter interset rest times, for example, two minutes, can be used without detriment to adaptation. Also, these sets can be integrated between technical drills, allowing multiple sets to be completed across a training session. And regarding the inter-repetition rest, despite the most common prescription being 20 seconds of passive rest between sprints, longer recovery periods, i.e. 30 seconds or more, may help the maintenance of sprint performance and training quality. And in terms of training volume, around 1,200 metres of repeated sprint training per week is effective for improving physical performance. However, smaller weekly volumes, for example less than 800 metres, may be prescribed at different time points within the season, for example at the start of pre-season to gradually expose athletes to maximal velocity, or during the in-season to maintain sprint exposure. And regarding sprint distance, as mentioned previously, 30 metres is an effective distance for all-round development of physical performance. However, slightly longer sprints, for example 40 metres, can be used to increase high-speed exposure, but this can cause greater metabolic stress and therefore fatigue. And lastly, regarding sprint modality, even though this is perhaps the least important programming variable to consider, different repeated sprint modalities may be used to challenge athletes in different ways. For example, linear sprints are recommended when the aim is to expose athletes to maximal velocity efforts, while shuttle-based repeated sprint training can be implemented to emphasise change of direction. However, it doesn't necessarily need to be an either-or approach, as alternating between linear and shuttle sprints across each session of a training programme could be a practical strategy to incorporate both formats within a mesocycle. And that concludes this presentation, summarising Fraser Furlow and colleagues' research regarding the effects of repeated sprint training on physical fitness and physiological adaptation in athletes. And as always, I recommend you go and check out the full article. The link is in the description. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time.